And so when these boys were born, the Bible says that Esau came out first, the older, and Jacob come out by grabbing his heel, and they called the older one Esau, who, who was red and hairy, as the Bible says. And Jacob um, was called uh, Jacob because his name was supplanter, deceiver, or heel grabber, and he lived up to his name. Not only was there discord in this family, even from the womb, but after these boys were born, there was also discord in this family. The Bible says that this family was divided by favoritism. Parents, that is one thing that will hinder a family is favoritism. You can't love one child more than you love the other. But the Bible says that, that, uh, that Isaac loved Jacob, who was a hunter, who was a man who'd go out and kill beasts and bring him food. But uh, Jacob uh, was loved by his mother. One was a daddy's boy and the other was a mama's boy. And there was favoritism in this dysfunctional family. If you have a dysfunctional family, don't worry because they've been around since the book of Genesis. Amen? <laughs> so may, let that make you feel a little bit better. Well, maybe we're not as bad as I thought, honey. Amen? Maybe, maybe we've got a hope and a chance. Dysfunctional families have been around all the way going back to the time uh, of the book of Genesis. But favoritism was, was a conflict that was within this Family, and there's no doubt that it led to uh, the dysfunction between these two boys. And I want us to read about the first event in Genesis chapter 25. And it says this, flipping back, this is what it says, or I'll read it from the screen. And it says this, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me. Uh, with some of the, that same red stew, for I am very weary. Therefore he said his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob, really for a pot of stew. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau, Moses writes, thus Esau despised the birthright. Now we've seen this playing out before. Jacob comes in, he's been working, or working, he's been hunting. He must not have been too great of a hunter, amen, because he comes back and he ain't got nothing to show for it. And he comes back, he has nothing, and he says, I'm weary, I'm, I'm about to die, I am famished. He says, give me some of that soup. I am hungry and it smells good. How many of you know when you're hungry, just about anything smells good? Amen. It don't matter. When you're starving and your stomach is eating on your backbone, amen, anything that you smell, mm, me, that would be good. And it must have, he must have been super hungry to sound like to me because that stew doesn't seem too pleasing to me. Red stew and lentils, uh, uh, no thank you on, on my end, amen. I've ever been a, a Delmonico steak or a ribeye, yes sir, we're in business here, but to sell the birthright for a pot of stew, he must have been pretty hungry. But now Jacob, being a wheeler, I believe a wheeler and a dealer, he saw an opportunity arise. We can't really fault Jacob in this matter. He, he saw an opportunity arise and he says, sure, brother, I've got something you want. You've got something I want. He said, how about we make a deal? I'll give you a pot of soup and you give me the birthright. Well, he said, well, what good is the birthright to me? I might as well give it to you. And that's why the Bible says that Esau despised him. The birthright. In this case, Jacob was not necessarily blamed, but it says that Esau was. Let me put it like this. Esau made a very bad choice. Amen. Esau made a very bad and even sinful choice. The Bible puts it like this, that it was a profane, profane choice. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Here, the author says that he was a profane person for selling his birthright for a piece of bread. Now, let me give you the definition of profane in case you don't know what it is. That it means this, to treat something sacred with abuse, irreverence, or contempt. In other words, Esau,
Esau belittled the very birthright of the, that was given to him by God. By God, he was the oldest, yet he belittled this very gift. Do you know what we say, Abraham, Isaac, and what? Jacob, but truly, by the birthright, it should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But he gave little regard to the things of God. He saw this lineage as insignificant thing. And he could not have the temporal satisfaction in that moment. Now, think about this furthermore. When you had the birthright, it also meant that you received two-thirds of the father's inheritance. <coughs> if there were two brothers, just like Esau and Jacob, the inheritance would have been broken up into thirds. And he would have received twice as much as the younger brother. That's another reason right there not to give up the birthright. Do you understand why I said that Esau made a foolish decision? Esau made a, if I could just put it very plainly, Esau made a stupid choice, didn't he? He made a profane choice. He made a, a foolish choice by selling his birthright. Now we can't blame, we can't blame Jacob. Think about this. If someone offers you a bad deal and you know it, is it their fault or your fault for taking it? Come on now. If somebody offers you a deal, uh, uh, offers you a bad deal, says, hey, I, I, I'm uh, upset. I buy your car for $500 and you know good and well it's worth $20,000. But if you're foolish enough to take it, now whose fault is that? That's your fault. And that's what the Bible's saying there, that he was Esau that despised the birthright. He knew good and well that that wasn't no good deal. Two-thirds of the inheritance that he's losing, and here he is going to give it up for a little something that's temporary to fill his stomach. It was Esau who made the foolish choice. Amen? Just hold on to that for just a moment, if you will. Esau made a foolish choice. He made a sinful choice. Now, now let's look at the second thing that happened to Esau because that's not the only thing. It wasn't something that happened to him. He, he, he made that choice. But then something else later on happens to Esau that we read about in chapter 27 of Genesis. And we'll just read verses 19 through 24. Now, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau. Right there on the warning flag, Jacob said, I am Esau. What's he doing right there? He's lying, isn't he? I am your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise and sit and eat my game that your soul may be blessed, that you may bless me. He's about to steal the blessing. But Isaac said to his own son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, of my son? And he said, See right here, not giving you, we talked about uh, uh, Esau not being a good hunter, and his daddy knew it. Amen. And he said, Because the Lord God brought it to me. Isaac said to, Je to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. The reason he's saying this is because Isaac was about blind. So Jacob went near to Isaac, to his father, and he felt him. And the voice, he says, the voice was like Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, you are really my son. Are you really my son Esau? And Jacob said, yes, I am. Amen. <clears throat> now this is the story of the account of where Jacob goes into his father and he steals the blessing. What should have been spoken over Esau Jacob goes in and deceives his father by putting some hair on his arm and, and bringing in a meal that his mother pre prepared and goes in he re receives the prophetic word that should have been spoken over his brother Esau. Now, the Bible tells us that he didn't do this alone. He didn't, I don't think, you know, first of all, I don't know if men are this smart to come up with a plan like we read about this story because we see that his mother come up with this plan of how to do it and go all about it and listen to what uh, uh, was said unto them in Genesis 27 when Jacob says, hey, mama, what if I get caught? And she says this, or he says, perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Notice that right there. He said, I'll bring a curse on me and not a blessing. He knew what he was doing was what? Wrong. 
He knew what he was doing and he knew that if he got caught, he said, it's going to bring a curse on me. But notice this, what it said. It says, I'll be cursed. But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. Go get that food and I'm going to prepare it for you. Here they were, they know, knew good and well that it was wrong in what they were about to do on Esau, but she said, well, we're going to do it anyway. Anyway, they deceived their father, and he stole the birthright, or excuse me, the blessing in this account from Esau. The first account I brought out to you how Esau made a foolish choice, didn't he? But in this is what I'm trying to point out unto you is this, is that Esau was wronged by his brother who deceived his father. He was wronged by someone else. It was not his choice. It was the choice of somebody else. Now, let me just remind you why and the, the blessing of a father was so important. The Bible says that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all spoke blessings of, over their children. And in the Old Testament, a blessing from a father would include words of encouragement. It would include details regarding their inheritance. But it also would be prophetic words concerning their future. So what it is, receiving a blessing from one's father would be a very high honor. But losing that blessing would be equivalent to a curse. I'll say that again. Why was it so detrimental? Him receiving the blessing was, was, was such a high honor, but if you lost that, it would be equivalent to a curse. Notice what Esau says when he finds out that his brother stole the curse. Listen, he says this. He says, have you not received, a, excuse me, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Look at verse 20. 36 in chapter 27. And Esau said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? In verse 34, he said this. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me. Bless me, O father, also. Now there's two things that I want us to look at that what happened to Esau. First of all, he made a terrible choice by selling his birthright. And secondly, he wronged, uh, he was wronged by his brother when he was the birthright, excuse me, the blessing was stolen from him. Both of these events. <coughs> As Esau, he says there, he says, first of all, he took the birthright, which that was Esau's fault. And he said, but now he's taking the blessing. So what do I have left? Is what he's saying right there in that scripture. What have I got left? Because of the choices that I made and because of what other people have done to me, hey, my life is over. My future has been stolen from me. I want to ask you something tonight. Have you ever made any bad choices in your life? <laughs> Woo! Y'all never laughing on that one, ain't yes. you? Ain't none of us made any bad choices in your life. <laughs> have, have, I want us to look at the, the life of Esau, bad choices, and then also wrongdoing. Have you ever made any bad choices in your life? And think about the things that you could look back over the choices of your youth. Amen. Anybody made any choices when you was young? Now you think, oh man, I regret that. Amen. I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have said that. I wish I wouldn't have went with that person. I wouldn't have done that. We probably all got the regrets uh, and bad choices that we made in relationships. Amen. Things we shouldn't have done and things, uh, people that we shouldn't have been with. Have you got any regrets in the past about financial decisions? Or things that you did with your money. I mean, probably when we were younger, we threw a lot of money away, wasted money on foolish things, and now we wish we just had a little bit of that money back. We made some bad choices. Maybe you made choices when you were younger in drugs or addiction or with alcohol. Have you ever made such bad choices, though? Get this. Have you ever made such bad choices, though, you felt your life was over? 
You remember, remember a time thinking, my life will never be the same because of what I've done. Yeah. What I chose to do. What I did. How am I going to overcome this? Some, because of something that you did or something that you said, you believe that you would never be able to move past that failure. I wonder tonight if some of you are living with the past on your back. If you struggle every day thinking about things that you wish you would have done different, don't you imagine in that moment, as, as, as Esau's thinking back to selling the birthright, don't you think he was regretting that now? Amen. Don't you think he was regretting, wishing that he would have never given that up to for a pot of stew? He, instead of taking that bad deal, he should have said, oh no, I'm going to go on down the road. I'll find somebody else to get food from. But he did. There was a regret there. And the fact of it is, we all have made mistakes and we have made sinful choices in our life. And do you know what? In order for us to be free of that, do you know what we've got to do? Do you know what we've got to First of all, we've got to confess our sins to Jesus Christ. I believe. Yep. The Bible says in John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says this. Is that we will confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Jesus is ready and willing to forgive us of them bad, sinful choices that we made. Mm -hmm. All of them sinful choices of your youth. Remember all of them? He said, bring them to me and I'll forgive you. Amen. Bring those things to me. And you say, well, how is that possible that the Lord can forgive me uh, of all them sinful choices? Because he can take old things and make them new. Right. He can take old things and make them new. But first of all, we gotta, we got to ask forgiveness for the one that cleanses our soul. But do you know else, how else we've got to let go of all of that past? You've got to be willing to forgive yourself. Amen. You've got to be willing to forgive yourself. He's like, well, Pastor, why in the world are you, are you trying this to shake it off? Because, see, that is your choice and nobody else is what you choose for yourself. I want you to listen to what is said and spoken over Esau. The blessing that his father spoke to him in Genesis chapter 27, verse 40. Listen to this. Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. Those are the same words that he used for Jacob. But then he, this part is different. But by the sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass, when you become restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. I'm going to read that in another translation. He says this, you will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But when you decide to break through, when you get tired of living under that bondage, you will shake his yoke off or from your neck. Can I tell you something? There's something that you've got to do. It is your choice whether you want to live in the past or not. Amen. Come on, it's, it's your choice. Amen. I just said the word of God declares that Jesus said, I will forgive you. I can turn your past around. I can make all things new. But it is your choice of whether you want to continue to drag the past along with you or not. But what I want to say to you tonight, every, every young person in here that's ever made a stupid decision, or every adult in here, you regret things that you did uh, last week or maybe 10, 20 years ago. I want to encourage you to get in your mind that you're tired of living with the past and the shame and the guilt on your back and say, I've had enough. I'm ready to forgive myself and move on. Amen. You talk about a miserable person. You talk about a miserable person. Somebody that gets up every morning and looks in the mirror and they despise the person that they see because of regret. Right. What happened yesterday? I wish I'd have never done that. They, they look and they, you see the shame. You see regret. You see bondage of the past. I want to tell you something tonight. If that's speaking to you, shake that yoke off tonight. You don't have to carry that. Jesus made a way for the, to bring us freedom. The Bible says, "He, uh, the Son, whom He whom the Son sets free, is free indeed." That's right. And so, know tonight, you don't have to carry around that bondage of your past. Let me tell you something: your past does not determine your future. Can I say it? your past does not determine your future? What what you've done in the past. Don't matter how, don't matter how terrible. It does not determine what God has in store for your future. There's so many great men and, and women of God, and one I'm just comes to my mind as I'm standing here is, is Reggie Depp. We used to hear him 
when, when he hears testimony many times when we would go to youth events and we go to Atlanta and he tells the story about things that he went through and how his testimony is this. He was literally the result of a $20 bill that his, his mama was a prostitute and his mama got pregnant and that's where he came from. And he talks about all the terrible things that he went through but he said that one day God put me in a, the right family, a foster home and he got saved and his life was totally changed and God uses him now to reach hundreds of Thousands of young people for Christ. It doesn't matter what your past may be. You don't have to carry that around because Christ can save it and He can make it all things new. Yes, Lord. But I want to encourage you. Christ is willing to forgive you. You've got to be willing to forgive yourself. Yes, You've got to be willing to forgive yourself and make your mind up tonight when you decide to break free. When you decide, I've had enough of carrying this yoke around then you'll break free. I've always believed that, whether it be anybody in, even in addiction or strongholds or whatever, you're not going to get set free until you get your mind made up, I'm, I want to be free. Amen. Until you get your mind made up, I'm tired of dragging this around, I'm tired of the same old thing. It ain't going to change, is it, Danny? But you've got to kind of get sick of where you are and say, I'm ready for a change. There's nothing Nothing that determines your, the past does not determine your future. Amen. Amen. Yesterday does not determine your future. Christ makes all things new. <coughs> now let's talk about the second thing that happened to Esau. First of all, one thing he had to do, he had to forgive himself for really a stupid choice that he made that cost him the birthright. But also, something else happened to Esau that was out of his control. His brother going in there and stealing the blessing, the prophetic word that was spoken over him, over his brother. He, he had nothing to do with that, did he? He was not there. It wasn't something that he foolishly gave up. His brother went in and deceived his father, and he received the blessing. It was nothing that he had done. He was wronged by somebody else. He was wronged by somebody else. How many of you have ever, have ever been wronged by somebody else. Woo, we wrote Broadway right both hands on that. <laughs> Have you ever been wronged by somebody else and someone else's actions? Amen. Maybe right now you're living in a hell right now because of what somebody else has done to you. Maybe because somebody else walked out on you, because somebody cheated on you, because somebody stabbed you in the back, somebody lied to you, somebody has just broken you, somebody that was close to you has taken away something that was very precious unto you. Mm, that's a painful thing, isn't it? And naturally, when that happens, do you know what we want to do? We want revenge. We want justice, and we, 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 we want to see vengeance come to that person. Amen. That's exactly what Esau wanted to, wanted to begin with. The Bible says this, when he found out that his brother Jacob had stole the blessing, he said, I'm going to kill him. Yeah. I'm going to kill him. Anybody ever been mad to throw that turn around? That boy, oh, I'm so mad, I just kill him right now. <clears throat> Kill him. That's what, that's what Esau wanted to do to Jacob because he had been wrong so. And it's natural for all of us to want vengeance, to want revenge on those that have hurt us. And I hope that you're not in a place like Esau that you're ready to kill somebody because of what they've done to you. But you know what we will do, though? We will sue over what they've done to us. We'll hold on to it. And we'll think about it and think about it some more. And then we'll think about it some more. How many of you have ever had to, well, I'm saying we'll take a mole hill and make it into a mountain, amen? amen. And we'll let that sore fester in our hearts. And we'll, we'll just say, they just did that on purpose. And we'll think about, oh, you just get in mind how evil they were because of what they did. And you'll just get yourself worked up into a tizzy. Come on, to a fit because you're so angry at that person. Whose blood pressure is going up? <laughs> Woo. Who's losing sleep at night? Who, whose hair is starting to turn gray and pull out, amen, in that state that you're in? It ain't theirs, it's yours, friend. And so what happens when, 
when you're not willing to forgive somebody and you want to hold on to unforgiveness, do you know what you're doing? You're living under their yoke. You're living under bondage. They're not. They're going right along. They don't even know that you're laying up at night thinking about them just stewing and angry over everything they said or done to you. Friend, if some of you might be in that bondage of unforgiveness to other people that have wronged you, I've come by here to remind you tonight it ain't worth it. If Jesus is willing to forgive you of your sins, you ought to be willing to forgive yourself. But secondly, if Jesus Christ is willing to forgive your enemy of what they've done, can I tell you something? You ought to be willing to forgive them too. Yes, that might be harder to swallow than the first one of those happened. Amen. If he can forgive them, we ought to be willing to forgive them as well. Yes, Just as we have received grace, we ought to be ready to, to give grace. <laughs> And until we're really, really willing to do that, <coughs> can I tell you something? You're going to live under bondage. Your joy in the Lord is going to be limited when you're holding unforgiveness in your heart. Amen. It's going to be limited because you're holding on to something that's ungodly. You're holding on to something that is unrighteous. That's not of God. God's very nature and character is to forgive. Amen. It's to love. It's to give grace. It is worth. That's his very character. That's who he is. Yes, yes. And so when we hold on to unforgiveness, you ain't acting like the Lord. You act like the devil. Mm -hmm. Woo. Come on. Come on now. When you 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 stood and you conniving and you're not acting like God, you act more like the devil. And I'm telling you tonight, I want you to have freedom. Yes, Lord. His father spoke this over Esau. But when you decide to break free, when you decide that you want to walk in freedom, you're going to shake it off. You're going to shake that, 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 that yoke of bondage off of your neck. And I'm telling you tonight, if, if you're not willing to forgive yourself for what you've done in your past, you're living in bondage. If you're not willing to forgive other people of what they have done to you, I don't care how bad it, or how small it may be, you're living under bondage. I can tell you this. I believe that Esau, as we look at his life, he forgave himself, but he also forgave his brother. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? How, how do you know that Esau forgave himself and he moved on and he also forgave uh, his, his brother? Because we read in Genesis chapter 33, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, we read of their encounter 20 years after Jacob steals the blessing. It says this in chapter 33. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two men, the, the maid, wife, maid servants, excuse me, and he put the maid servants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind Rachel, and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. This is Jacob. Remember, he's the one that stole he stole the blessing. Twenty years later, now he's got to face big brother. Notice he's going back humble, amen. Can I say this too? That when you have wronged somebody, we see humility in Esau, excuse me, we see humility in Jacob approaching his brother. When you have wronged somebody, you need to return to them yes, in humility. Amen. Amen. When, we, when you return to apologize to somebody and you've got an attitude that goes along with it, kind of like, well, I'm sorry, but you deserved it kind of attitude, <laughs> that apology don't make it, amen, to them. I promise you. It don't come off the right way when you say, well, I'm sorry, but you deserved it. You had it coming. That don't work. It don't fly. But notice Esau, Jacob returned to Esau 20 years later, and he has humility. But, but notice what Esau does now. He ran to meet him. He embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children. He said, 
Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maid servants came near. They and their children bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. And Esau said, What do you mean by all of this company which I met? No, it, Jacob had sent out a bunch of gifts to meet Esau. And he said, These are to find favor in your sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Does that sound like a man that's angry? But does that sound like a man that's holding a grudge still? He had decided, I'm not going to live in the past. Amen. I made some wrong choices. <clears throat> That was my fault. I've got to live with them. I've got to forgive myself. And then I've got to go on. You know the old saying, Mama said, there ain't no need in crying. There was filled with milk. Okay? Right. What is done is done. What you did yesterday is done. You can't change yesterday. If we could, I mean, every one of us would go back somewhere and change something. Wouldn't we? Yeah. Every one of us. But we can't. So there's no need in being stressed over something you can't change. Esau had to move on. But also, he had shook off that yoke of bondage unto his brother. He wasn't living in unforgiveness and hate and anger towards him because what he had done 20 years ago, he had let it go. Yeah. Somebody say, let it go. Let it go. Yeah. It ain't worth holding on to that. And you know what? Esau might have made some foolish choices. Esau might have been wronged by other people. But do you know what? God still blessed Esau. God still blessed Esau even though he made some foolish choices. And even though that people had wronged him, when Esau decided to go on and live life, God blessed him too. Because you know what the Bible says? I don't think I gave the man this verse. But this it says in Genesis 36 verse 7 that Jacob and Esau both had so much they had so much, so much cattle, so much uh, uh, sheep and such as that, they could not live together in the same region because the land couldn't support all their livestock. Mm -hmm. That's how blessed Jacob was, but it's also how blessed Esau was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just because you messed up in your past, and just because somebody has harmed you or done wrong to you, doesn't mean that God can't bless you in your future. That's right. Just, just because you make some stupid decisions doesn't mean that God don't have a future for you. Just because somebody wrongs you does not mean that God can't bless you in the future. Amen. See, because nobody, no person can hinder God's plan for you. Praise the Lord. And can't nobody, no man, ain't no devil in hell can stop God's plans for you. They try and hinder them, they might slow that, but they can't stop what God has for you. Amen. So stop holding yourself hostage. Stop holding these other people hostage. It's only doing you, it's only doing you harm. And shake it off. Get that yoke of bondage off of you tonight. Amen. Come on to the music. I'm, I'm closed. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done rambling tonight. Amen. Yesterday is dead and gone. We got to look to the future. If God forgives you, forgive yourself. Amen. But also, if God forgives your enemy, ooh, it's time to forgive them as well. Yes, Lord. Can I can I close with this thought? Sometimes we say, "Well, I'll forgive them if they apologize." <laughs> I'll forgive them if they explain to me why they did what they did. It don't work like that. Stop looking for an expl explanation. Stop, stop, stop waiting on them to come back and grovel at your feet and they may not even realize how deeply they hurt you. But in the grace of Jesus Christ, say, God, I'm going to forgive them just like you forgave me of all my wrongdoings, and I'm going to move on tonight. Amen. I don't know who may have needed that tonight. I don't know who that may have needed to encourage, but I want to encourage you as we close this service. If you've been dealing with something I've been preaching about, then I'm telling you, don't leave here tonight carrying that bondage on your neck. Don't leave here tonight continuing to go down the same old road. But make up your mind. Yes, Lord. 
decide, I want to be free from that. I want to let that go. Years ago, I had somebody that hurt me deeply, and I went to them, and uh, God worked it out. It was God. It was only God. And uh, I felt like I wanted to tell. I, I was angry at them enough to say, I hate them. I would get so mad, I would think of their name or, or whatever, and I said, I hate that person. I, and God dealt with them, but this went on for three years. Three years, three, four years. And I thought, oh, I just get mad. Anybody think of something, you just get angry. And God dealt with me about it and, said, and God said, you need to forgive that person. And I said, okay, I'll do it. You make it happen. A week later, they messaged me on Facebook asking that I want something back with that was insignificant and worthless in value. But I said, okay, God, I'll take the door that you've opened. And I said, yes, I'll go back. I said, I do want to get that back. And I wanted to talk to you anyway. And I went to see this person. And first of all, I told them, I said, I'm sorry for anything that I have done against you. I said, if, I, if I've said something, done something to hurt you, please forgive me. I said, but also I wanted to tell you that for a very long time I've been mad at you because of what you did, that you hurt me deeply. And I said, I even to the point that I hated you, but I, but I asked the Lord to forgive me of that, and I want to forgive you too. I forgive you. I hold nothing against you anymore. When I said that, I was looking for an explanation of what had happened. I was expecting that person to say, I'm sorry that I did that and this and this and this. And all they said was, well, I'm sorry too. Not, not smart, but they just said, I'm sorry too. And I left there thinking, God, I wanted a little bit more than that. <laughs> I did. I left. I said, God, you, know, I, you brought me over here. Now, I had, to, I had the courage, God, to come in here and face this person after four or five years. I said, and, and, and this is all I got? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. Honest to goodness, from that day, God started healing my heart. Amen. And I no longer Amen. would get angry. When I see that person, no longer would I break out in a sweat and get mad and get angry. But God healed me. I got a little scar right here on my hand years ago from trapping birds. The scar is there. I remember where I was at. I was behind my Uncle Tamridge's house. I was on the full wheeler. I was about 10 years old when I got my hand caught in the trap and wire jabbed down through my arm. I remember. But you know what? That sore has been healed. It don't hurt me anymore. I remember it all, but it don't hurt me anymore. Amen. When you would truly forgive somebody, the scar will never go away. The memory of it is not just going to vanish out of sight. God is not going to slap you with holy amnesia. <laughs> but what will happen when you will forgive somebody and you get that yoke of bondage off your neck? God will start healing your heart and your brokenness and the scar will be there, but it won't hurt you any longer. I'm telling you tonight, there is, there is something free about forgiveness. Yes, Lord. And I'm telling you, if you're living in unforgiveness, you are missing out on the freedom and the healing that Jesus Christ has to offer the Lord. Would you stand your feet all over the house? The altar is open tonight as we sing. If you're dealing with unforgiveness, whether it's yourself or somebody, Maybe you want special prayer. Maybe you need to pray about it. Then I ask you to come as we sing.